I've titled this talk, Elias. Now, as I told you before, the first time I ever walked into an Adventist church, I looked at them and I said, oh no, God help me. And I wanted to run as far away from them as the East is from the West. And to be quite honest with you, I came from a very brash, secular world, and some of them looked like nerds to me. And some of those that were the most nerdish and the most irritating to me in the beginning have in the meantime become the most precious to me. So it means that, that something can change in the human psyche if we permit God to actually do it. But you don't do something like this lightly. You have to have reasons why. Now, Matthew 17, 11 said, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. So before the Lord will end what is happening on this planet, Elias will first come and restore all things. Does that mean that everything is in a, in a position of being unrestored, being in chaos? Yes. The religious world today is in total chaos and has to be restored. Now, there were a number of Elias or Elijahs. The one is just the Greek form. The other one is the, the Hebrew form. 1 Kings 18.17 speaks about the first Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Uh, the message that Elijah brings is not a popular message. The kings of the world are not too thrilled when this message is proclaimed. And for that matter, the people are not too thrilled either. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, for thou hast forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. So the Elijah message is, you have to be restored to follow and worship God and not to have a religion of Baal which you sell as a religion of God. And it's also a question of the restoration of the commandments which lie shattered on the highways and byways. Now, the second time the Elijah issue comes up is in the case of John the Baptist. Matthew 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So part of the Elijah message is saying that the time is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, what was the role of John the Baptist? Because Jesus said that if you believe it, Elijah is here. Not the physical Elijah, but the same message that the previous Elijah had preached. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, here's the job that he has to do, the job description. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Does it say all? No. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Right from the beginning. Now there's a typology in that, and we'll come to that later. Could we then assume that the Elias or Elijah that would come just before the great and terrible day of the Lord that has to restore true doctrine and right thinking would also be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb? 
Yes. Because if type dictates it, then anti-type fulfills it. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Does it say all? No. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. So it's the same message. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So it's a message calling people back to obedience to God and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It's a message that has to go out to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. John the Baptist prepared the way for the first coming of Christ. Just before the end, there will be another Elijah message to prepare a people for the Second coming of Christ. The one is a type, it was local. The anti-type will be universal. That's how it works. That's how typology works. You always go from small to great. The lamb was the type of Christ. It referred to someone greater, the Lord himself. And he said, someone greater than the prophets, greater than the kings, was there. So type is always progressive to a larger reality. Luke 1, 76, And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. So people have to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, to give knowledge of salvation. Today, there's more confusion about salvation than there has ever been in the history of mankind. Some people say you are under grace. You don't have to keep the law. The law has been done away with. Others say, no, you have to stick to the commandments and the Messiah has not even come yet. You have all of that on this planet. And total rebellion says, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Break every commandment. And then you'll be happy. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness. So this message has to go to those who have not got any light about Jesus and uh, salvation. In the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. So was he in... The prominent places, was he at the schools of the prophets? No, he was in the desert, it was an obscure voice. Now Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So when we have to guide our feet in the way of peace, then in which way must we guide it? You know, in the way of obedience to God's commandments. The first Elijah said, it's not I that trouble Israel, it's you and your father's house because you have forsaken the commandments. The second Elijah said to King Herod, what you are doing is not lawful. You have taken as a wife your brother Philip's wife. She's not yours. You are breaking the commandments. Herodias blew a gasket. And she got her daughter to do a little jig. And so the head of John the Baptist was sacrificed. So it's always calling back to obedience to God's precepts. Now the book of Revelation reveals the characteristics of the remnant that will preach this type of message. And so we have to take cognizance of it. What does the book of Revelation reveal about the last message to mankind. Jeremiah 6 verse 2 says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So God's people have always been compared to a woman, but a pure woman. And the apostates have always been compared to a harlot. Say unto Zion, thou art my people. So God's people are compared to a comely and delicate woman. In the Bible, the bride of Christ is a comely and delicate woman. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.2 The church is the chaste virgin. Now in Revelation chapter 12, we read about the woman. Now obviously when God compares his church and his people to a woman, then you have to read the Bible in this context. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Revelation 12, 6. Okay, now if you were a Catholic and in Catholicism, this woman would be Mary. But you'd be in serious problems because when did Mary flee into the wilderness and did she, did she stay there for 1,303 score, 203 score days? Answer is no. Of course, this is a reference to which time period? It's the time period of papal supremacy from 538 AD to 1798 when the church of God was persecuted. And the church of God, and there were Sabbath keepers, by the way, the Waldensians, the Albigensians, they were Sabbath keepers. The church in the East and the Celtic church, they were Sabbath keepers. So they were persecuted. And they fled to the solitary places, to the wilderness. And God had prepared that place so that his message shouldn't die out. And for 1,260 years of persecution, they were in the wilderness. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now there's another... Hebrew parallelism, the same story repeated in another framework. Now, this is where Catholicism says, so it's Mary because she brought forth Jesus. But Jesus always identified himself with his people, Israel. And salvation is from the Jews, didn't he say so? So out of the Jewish nation, God's people, the Messiah came forth. Did the serpent persecute the Messiah? Yes. And after the Messiah's birth, did he persecute the church that proclaimed salvation in him? Yes or no? Yes. So the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time. That's the same time as the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7 from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. What did the papal system use to persecute and destroy these people? The nations. The nations around. The waters you saw are peoples, nations, multitudes and kings, says Revelation. So he sent the French to destroy the Albigensians the French and the, the Italians to destroy the Valdenses. He sent the armies of Europe to destroy Protestantism. He sent the Spaniards with Alva as their general to go and destroy Protestantism in France and in the north, in Belgium and in Holland. And he literally chased the Dutch into the sea. Literally. The entire Belgium was Protestant. Today, nothing is Protestant. The entire north of France, the entire south of France was Protestant. Today, no Protestants. And a small little handful of remnants sitting there in Holland, totally secularized, believing nothing anymore, sitting in their dikes in the ocean, waiting for them to come over. So there was persecution, yes. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So the woman escaped. And where did she go to? She went to the 
unpopulated areas of the world. Now the second beast of Revelation 13 arose where? Out of the earth. So where did most Christians flee to? To the New World, to the Americas. That's where they fled to. Some of them fled to Africa and some of them fled to New Zealand and Australia and those areas. Okay, so the earth helped the woman. Now, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. And then he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And then it has some attributes which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So after the 1,260 years of persecution, the earth helps the woman and they occupy the new world. That's the time period that we lived in. And then at the end of that, since 1798, at the end of that period, there must be a remnant which keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we have a time frame. And the dragon is wroth with this woman and he goes to make war with that remnant. He doesn't like this remnant. So what is a remnant? Obviously something that is like the original. So it must have the same teachings. It must have a Christ-centered religion. It must teach that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. And that there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you must be saved. It must teach that you are saved by grace and grace alone because that's what the woman taught. So it must teach salvation by faith. But it must also teach that you must keep the commandments of God. Because that's what the woman taught. They kept everything. They even kept the Sabbath. So they must be like the original. And we've been through some of the doctrines of the originals. They even believed, Lutherans and all of these people, the doctrine of soul sleep and all of these issues. They had the same prophetic framework as we discussed of late. So they have to be Protestant. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. So there are two aspects that are very important. They have both of them. Today, if you take the Jewish community, they keep the commandments. They're standing on one leg. They reject Jesus as the Messiah. Christianity at large today accepts Jesus as the Messiah and rejects the commandments. What about standing on two legs? Isn't that a good idea? Wouldn't it be more stable? Keeping the commandments not as a means to salvation but as a consequence of salvation. Go and sin no more. So they must have both attributes. Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. What did Jesus say when the rich young ruler came and asked them, what must I do to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. And Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Not one jot or tittle will disappear from the law until all things have been accomplished. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. So this is an essential part of the remnant teaching. So the two distinguishing characteristics of God's remnant church is it keeps the commandments of God. Number two, it has the testimony of Jesus. Now that's tricky. What does that mean? What is the testimony of Jesus? Well, let's read it in the Bible. And I fell at his feet to worship him. So an angel is giving John the revelation and he falls at the angel's feet and the angel rebukes him and says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. He said to me, see that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So now you know what the testimony of Jesus is. It's the spirit of prophecy. So the remnant church must keep the commandments, they must have the faith of Jesus, and they must have the spirit of 
prophecy. Three identifying features. So God's last day church would keep the commandments and have the gift of prophecy. Now let me go to Revelation chapter 10, which is a beautiful story of the, the how shall I put this, of the growth of the remnant and how it was to take place. Revelation chapter 10 tells the story, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his feet were, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, the only ones who had such visions were the prophets of old. Daniel describes him in this way. It's a, it's a vision of Jesus Christ who shines like the sun. And he had one foot in the, on the sea and one foot on the earth. He covered the entire globe, the nations, the uninhabited places. He was Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And he had in his hand a little book open, a scroll. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now the voice of God is like thunder. Seven is the divine number. Seal up the things which God had said, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, saying, Ever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which therein are. So this is the seal of God. This is the jurisdiction of God. You also find it in the fourth commandment, that same statement. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea, swings of water, etc. There should be time no longer. Now what time is this talking about? So here he is, and he has an open scroll in his hand, and he talks about a sealing that was not to be written, that God had said, but that was not to be revealed. And then it says there should be time no longer. Time no longer. Now the only prophecy in the entire Bible that is sealed is the last portion of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 8. And that is the prophecy which says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now this is a complicated prophecy that I'm not going to deal with in, in this lecture. It's in a, in a whole lecture all by itself. But it has a starting point, and it says when it is to begin. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And that decree went out in 457 BC when Artaxerxes made the decree that Jerusalem was to be inhabited and restored as a political entity. And then follows a prophecy which is messianic and gives the time period when the Jews would be the ones to propagate the message of salvation and when that time period would end and precisely when the Messiah would come, and precisely when the Messiah would die, and it works perfectly. There is no movement in this prophecy. And then, in AD 34, when that first portion of the prophecy is fulfilled, then the time of the Gentiles would come when they would proclaim the gospel. And then Paul was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and Peter had the vision that he should call no man impure, that the gospel should go to the Gentiles. And the full length of the prophecy is 1,300 days, so being day years, it would end in 1844. It cannot be anything else but day years, otherwise the entire first part of the prophecy, which is messianic, wouldn't be fulfilled. And as it is, it is fulfilled to the letter by Jesus Christ. Because in 27 AD, Jesus started his ministry. Bang on time. And three and a half years later, as according to the prophecy, he died. 
And three and a half years later, at the stoning of Stephen, the message went to the Gentiles. So the rest of the prophecy must also be true. And it brings us to a weird date, which is 1844. Now, 1844 is a fascinating, fascinating date in world history. It is the final culmination of all isms to attack the reality and the truth of God's word. Everything happened in 1844. The theory of evolution, Charles Darwin's book, Origin of Species, 1844, says so in the foreword. 1844. Communism. And communism started by excluding all things religious and all things pertaining to religion and Jesus Christ. So it was an atheistic system. And that happened in exactly 1844. All the other isms that we have all the existentialisms, and then spiritism, with the Fox sisters, with the rapping, 1844. Spiritualistic, biblic, uh, religious, secular, political, all of these systems started in 1844. And at the same time, as the message goes out, God is not the creator, we need political systems that exclude God from our political systems. At the same time, a message goes out. Now, the angel says, go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel. Now, when, when Daniel received this vision, he didn't understand it. So he said to the angel, I don't understand it. And he was thinking about the vision, and then he prayed and he fasted about the vision. And then God revealed to him most of the aspects of the vision. And the last part, God said, is sealed to the time of the end. It is sealed until the time of the end. And Daniel still wanted to know what it meant about And God said to him, you, Daniel, go your way. You will rest and you will go to your grave and you will sleep because this vision is sealed until the time of the end. And nobody ever wrote anything about this portion of the vision, and nobody understood the vision of the 2,300 days until the time of the end. Now, when is the time of the end start? In Daniel chapter 12, it tells you the time of the end starts at the end of the 1,260 days. We have a date for that. When is that? 1798. So from that time onward, exactly when the remnant would be persecuted by the serpent, the dragon, then this vision would be unfolded. So now the angel has this book in his hand, and he says, and it's open now, and he says, take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. You must prophesy again. So maybe they thought, oh, the book is open. We're in the time of the end. It's all over. Prophecy and time for preaching is over. But he gets a message, no, you must prophesy again. Too many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, what does all this mean? Let's go to parallel texts to unpack it. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So here we have the idea of eating God's word. Ezekiel makes it even clearer. And he says, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowl, bowels with this roll, this book scroll, that I give thee. Then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Okay, so what does it mean 
to go and eat the scroll. It means to internalize the message and then this message, as you begin to understand it, is sweet as honey. And when it happened to Ezekiel, there was only sweetness. I did eat it in my mouth. As it was as sweet as honey. And then he said to me, Son of man, get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. So this message that is sweet to the prophet must be preached to the house of Israel. Was it always comfortable and sweet for them? No. They sought Isaiah in half. But the remnant has another story. He eats the scroll and it's sweet as honey. He internalizes it, he understands it, but something happens to it. What happens to it? It turns bitter in the stomach. And then he is told, you must prophesy again. Here, Ezekiel is just told, what is sweet, go and teach it. But there they are told, after the bitterness, now, you must prophesy again. Now, did it happen before that a bitter experience as a consequence of your concept of your understanding of the Word of God led to a total disappointment, dejectedness, and a bitter, bitter feeling of remorse and sadness? Yes. God used it after the crucifixion. So, what happened here? Here were the disciples, and they had expected the kingdom of God, because that was their sweet understanding. Jesus would announce himself as the Messiah. After all, he'd just come in riding on a donkey, being hailed as the Messiah. And instead of being the Messiah, he was dead on a cross. And their entire world picture was shattered. And here are two of them walking sadly to Emmaus, contemplating this issue. And as they're walking, someone appears between them and starts expounding the scriptures. And starting with the beginning of the Bible, working its way through all the way, he expounds those things concerning himself. And all of a sudden, the light goes on. And the bitter experience and the disappointment turns into what? Great joy. And after they recognized him as the Messiah, they didn't walk dejectedly, dragging their feet all the way back to tell the other disciples. They ran back. Now, why did God allow this bitter disappointment. After all, he told them ahead of time that the Son of Man was going to die. But they didn't understand it. It was sealed to them. They didn't comprehend it. And when it finally happened, they were totally devastated. Until they understood the fullness and the meaning of the Scriptures, once Jesus had personally come and enlightened them, and the lights went on, and they went and they prophesied again. And God permitted this sadness to separate the dross from the silver. Because there were so many hangers on to this Christianity, they were not really convicted in their hearts. But when the crucifixion took away that dream, who was left? A small little handful. And with that small little handful, Jesus could do something. And from that grew the great Christian movement. So the same method would be used at the end. They said, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Our dreams are shattered. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, give fear 
Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. So here at this period of time, after the 1,260 years, a scroll is opened, a sealed prophecy is unsealed, people internalize it, misinterpret it, become totally dejected, then in the same fashion, receive instruction and enlightenment on the true meaning of the prophecies, and they are told to go and preach again to many peoples, nations, and tongues. And what are they to preach again? The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Again, where do we find that? It's the seal of God. You find it in the fourth commandment. That's the place where it is. So worship God, give glory to him, and the hour of his judgment has come. You see, they believed that when they opened the scroll and the prophecy said there is time no more and the sanctuary would be cleansed, they believed that, well, maybe the sanctuary is this earth and it's going to be cleansed and time is finished and Jesus will come and prophecy is over. And they rejoiced and they waited for the year, and the year came, and the year went, and Jesus didn't come, and they were bitterly disappointed. Now, who am I speaking about? I'm speaking about a whole plethora of religious people out of every single denomination on the planet, with hundreds of pastors from all denominations reacting to the preaching of the Millerites that Jesus was coming as a consequence of their understanding of those prophecies which they misinterpreted. But then they studied them again and they discovered the great sanctuary message, the plan of salvation in the sanctuary message of the Old Testament. And the cleansing of the sanctuary was something that took place at a time period in the Jewish calendar where it typified the removal of sin from the sanctuary and it was a time when they had to live a life which was consecrated totally to God or else they would be cut off. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So a message went into the world, 1844, which said, God is not the creator of this world. Do you think God would leave a message like that unchallenged? Or would he empower them to send another message diametrically opposed? We are living in the time of judgment. We are living in the antitypical day of atonement. And we must worship him who made two messages. Revelation 14.8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And who is Babylon? Babylon consists of three components, the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. Now we discussed them in these lectures. The beast, the reformers said, was Catholicism. The false prophet was the one that came out of the earth, Protestantism that was doing the work of the first beast on his behalf and propagating the principles and the mindset of the first beast. And dragon worship is everything that is occult in the world, which would include all the isms. So they're fallen. Don't accept them because they have made the na nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. This is apostasy towards God. And the wine is the false doctrine which they have internalized. So that's another message. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In other words, whoever does not willingly accept the plan of salvation and accepts rather to follow the dictates of the beast will die as a consequence, will be destroyed 
in the final fire of destruction. Now, who preaches this message in the world? There's only one denomination that preaches it. Only one in the entire world. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Please note, it doesn't say the faith in Jesus. It says the faith of Jesus. Now, the faith of Jesus obviously includes the faith in Jesus, but it's much more. The faith of Jesus was such that he willingly went like a lamb to the slaughter and died for you and me. <coughs> so if we have the faith of Jesus, we must have that same faith. We must be willing to die for what we believe in. That's quite a powerful faith. And they keep the commandments of God. And they preach the three angels' messages. The hour of his judgment has come. Babylon has fallen. And the mark of the beast. Fascinating. It also has to be a worldwide movement because it has to preach to whom? Every nation, tribe, and people. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It must also have a separating message and not a unification message. Because Revelation 18.4, which is a repetition of the second angel's message about Babylon being fallen, says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and sin is transgression of God's law. And that you receive not of her plagues. And one, 2 Corinthians says the same thing. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So it's a separating message. Now, in the same period, when this message goes into the world, Freemasonry goes into the world, spiritualism, theosophy, which is the counterfeit, of this message goes into the world. Many false prophets arise. The Mormon movement is uh, instituted. Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science Movement. And the interesting thing is, if you want to study the history of the Jesuits and how they move, you will find them involved in all of these. You'll find them involved in all of these. Mormonism by the Jesuit to Smet etc., etc. Now, what does the word ecumenical mean? It me comes from the Greek term, term oikomena, which means the whole inhabited world, coming together in unity, but excluding Jesus Christ. So you have a counter-message which says, no, come out and be separate, because there's no other way whereby you can be saved. As the priest J. Cornell put it, the final object of ecumenism, as Catholics conceive it, is unity in faith, worship, and the acknowledgement of the supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. If you're a Protestant, if you're like the woman that fled into the wilderness and the remnant has to be like her, then she cannot go along with us. She has to be separate from it. And the problem is all the world wandered after the beast. So you have two camps. You have the camp that is aligned with the beast and you have this other one with this unpopular message. They're not going to be very welcome. Malachi 4.5 Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So just before the Lord comes, there will be this Elijah. Now just like John the Baptist wasn't the literal Elijah, just in the same way, the antitypical Elijah won't be a literal Elijah. But he'll have attributes. Would you agree that he has to keep the commandments of God? Would you agree that he has the testimony and the faith of Jesus Christ and the testimony is the spirit of prophecy? Would you agree that he arises out of a great disappointment sometime after 1798? Because that's when the remnant is persecuted by the dragon. And that this organization, whatever it is, has to preach the three angels' messages. Because that's the message that comes immediately after the statement, you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, and, and languages. 
And the three angels' messages are to be told to many peoples, kings, nations, and languages. And it has to be a worldwide movement. Now, who qualifies today? Who qualifies today? You can search the planet. Thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. If thou turn thy, away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. This is a prophecy of the restoration. They will be called repairers of the breach. Now, the wall was the wall that protected Israel, and it was a symbol of the law. There's a breach in the wall. There's a hole in the wall. The Sabbath commandment is gone. The law of God has been done away with through modern uh, ideologies. So they have to be repaired. Restorers of paths to dwell in. In other words, the ancient doctrines must be brought back to life. A right understanding of law and grace must be introduced into the world. And the Sabbath must be restored. That's part of the job of the remnant. Now, who does all that? So the final reform must be very similar. The Elijah message was one of repentance, call to follow God with the whole heart, keep the commandments. John the Baptist was an antitype of Elijah, and the same clarion call must be with the final Elijah. Now, the Advent movement arose at the end of the 18th century. Bang on time, the Advent movement starts. There was no Seventh-day Adventists. It's an Advent movement. It came out of all the denominations at precisely the right time in history. It appeared. It was an international movement. It came at a low tide of human spirituality. America had witnessed the turmoils of war and bloodshed. Europe had witnessed the French Revolution. God had been written out of the Constitution. The Bible had been banned. People were deists. There was no religion left of any value. And in this darkness, God wakes up a movement. So the revolution had sacrificed truth to the goddess of reason and U.S. Leonard Wolseley Bacon summarized the moral standard as follows. He writes, The closing years of the 18th century show the lowest low water mark of the lowest ebb tide of spiritual life in the history of the American church. The demoralization of army life, the fury of political faction, the catchpenny materialist morality of Franklin, the philosophic design of men such as Jefferson, the popular rivalry of Thomas Paine, probably one of the most vile occultists who ever walked this planet, and he's probably responsible of most of what happens in the political system of the United States, had wrought together with other untoward influences to bring about a condition of things which the eye of little faith seemed almost desperate. That's what the world was in, the state it was in, and out of this Hopeless situation came the great revival. All of a sudden, in Europe, in America, there was a great emphasis on the second coming of Jesus. Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation were scrutinized. Suddenly, the British and the Foreign Bible Societies were formed, 1804, the American Bible Society, 1860, the American Home Missionary Society. And one of the most prominent preachers of all was a man by the name of William Miller, and he's probably the most unlikely candidate that you could ever come up with. And, you know, I have, a, I have an idea that God specializes in unlikely candidates. Why was he an unlikely candidate? Well, he was a deist. A deist is someone who believes, well, there's a God up there, but uh, he's got nothing to do with us down here. He set the ball rolling and then he le left us to this misery and he doesn't care and there's no communication between him and us. He's up there, we're down here, we never meet by. That's a deist. And he had no formal religious training. Then he was also a Baptist, but he became disillusioned. But in 1816, he decided that he was sick and tired of all of this, and on top of all, he was a Freemason. And he put all this stuff aside, and he decided that he was going to study the Bible, and the Bible, and nothing else, 
and let no one tell him what it means. And for two and a half years, I think it was, he locked himself up. And this is what he wrote. While thus studying the scripture, I became satisfied that if the prophecies which have been fulfilled in the past are any criterion by which to judge of the manner of the fulfillment of those which are future, that the popular views of the spiritual reign of Christ a temporal millennium before the end of the world and the Jews' return are not sustained by the word of God. For I found that all these scriptures on which those favorite theories are based are as clearly expressed as are those that were literally filled at the first advent or at any other period in the past. I found it plainly taught in the scriptures that Jesus Christ will descend to this earth coming in the clouds of heaven in all the glory of his Father. Correct or not? We did it yesterday. That at the coming, the kingdom and dominion under the whole heaven will be given to him, and the saints of the Most High will possess it forever and forever. Biblical? Okay. That at his coming, the bodies of all the righteous dead will be raised, and all the righteous living will be changed from a corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal state. Correct? that they will all be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and will reign with him forever in the regenerated earth. Correct? I found that the only millennium taught in the word of God is the thousand years which are to intervene between the first resurrection and the rest of the dead and that of the rest of the dead. Correct? That were the Bible teachers? Funny that nobody else teaches it as inculcated in the 20th of Revelation that it must necessarily follow the personal coming of Christ and the regeneration of the earth, that till Christ's coming and the end of the world, the righteous and the wicked are continued together on the earth, and that the horn of the papacy is to warn against the saints, the war against the saints until his appearing and kingdom, when it will be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. Correct or not? He's a deist writing who doesn't even believe in a personal God, and he's decided that he's only going to study the Bible and see what the Bible says, and forget about all the teachings out there, and all the confusion. It must necessarily follow that the various portions of Scripture that refer to the millennial state must have their fulfillment after the resurrection of all the saints that sleep in Jesus. I also found that the promises respecting Israel's re restoration are applied by the apostle to all who are Christ's. Is that correct? Yes. The putting on of Christ, constituting them being Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's nothing there that I cannot agree with. Nothing. So regarding prophetic interpretation, William Miller applied the day-year principle exactly as the reformers had, had applied it. And he studied the 2,300 days and he came to the conclusion that if the first portion was right, well, then... I was thus brought in 1888 at the close of my two years' study of the scripture to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, about 1843, later he, he realized there was a year missing and he made it 1844, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. Hmm. Samuel Snow later emphasized the autumnal Jewish seventh month Tishri and they came to the conclusion that this is where the prophecy starts, that's where it ends, and they came up with the date 1844, and it turned out to be a vast disappointment. Now, one of the things against William Miller is that he was a Freemason. Yes, he was a Freemason. But, this is what he wrote. There's his own handwriting with his own signature, and this is what he wrote. I, William Miller, feeling willing to do everything that the gospel may permit me to do, to conciliate the feelings of my brethren in Christ, to hereby renounce my connection with the institution of masonry, and again to have no fellowship with any practice that may be incompatible with the word of God amongst masons. So he resigned. So just because he was a deist, just because he was a mason, does that mean God can't use a person like that? Wasn't uh, Tyndall a Roman Catholic priest? Wasn't Martin Luther a Roman Catholic priest and theologian? Wasn't Walter Feit an occultist and an atheist? And a Catholic? That's confusion for you. 
Miller's preaching led to the Great Advent Awakening, which had preachers like Josiah Litch. He was a Methodist minister. Charles Fitch, former pastor of the Congregational Church. Himes, pastor of the Second Christian Church. So it was all denominations. Now look how he preached. They published a magazine, Midnight Cry, and they had 10,000 copies were distributed per day. They preached at 130 camp meetings held between 1843 and 1844. Up to one million people attended. And the entire population of the United States then was 17 million. So he personally spoke to one in 17 in the entire United States. That's quite something. He preached 4,000 sermons in approximately 500 towns and cities. And the strangest people were involved. Litch, 19th century physician, minister of the Methodist Episcopal Church, accurately predicted two years in advance the fall of the Ottoman Empire, applying the day-year principle. And Joshua Himes published the first Millerite newspaper, The Signs of the Times. And they started another newspaper called The Midnight Cry. These were not Seventh-day Adventists. These were Adventists. And then after the great disappointment, there was only a handful left. And they studied the scriptures and studied the sanctuary message, and all of a sudden the plan of salvation blossomed. And suddenly they understood the gospel message as inculcated in the sanctuary message. Jesus was our righteousness. The altar of burnt offering stood for the cross. The laver stood for the washing of rebirth. The candlestick, Jesus, the light of the world, Jesus, the mediator, Jesus, the showbread, and the law of God, and he being the mercy seat, and the rituals, and all of those things. And so, after a conference meeting, five pillars of Adventism were discovered. The first one, the sanctuary doctrine, which explained the gospel in type. Then the doctrine of the second advent. Then the Sabbath then the state of the dead, and then the spirit of prophecy. Now let me explain something to you. All of these were discovered by Bible study in exactly 1844. That's really quite something. This is different people, totally different backgrounds, the weirdest backgrounds you can ever expect. And later to this, a health message was added which strengthened the right arm. Now, there were two people that were also involved, and one of them was James White. He was born on the 4th of August, 1821, and he married a lady called Ellen Harmon, and uh, Ellen White suffered a facial inju injury when a stone was thrown by a classmate when she was nine years old, and these two have the most amazing story that you can imagine. This little girl, nine years old, struck by a stone, so it's three years of schooling. And then she ended up half paralyzed on one side, and she could no longer attend school. And she became the greatest female author that has ever existed. She has written more books on religion and Jesus Christ than any other author, female author, in history. Her husband has even a weirder story. James White was born with a defect, an eye defect. He was squint, incredibly squint. His eyes were like this. And his left eye could only see the right wall, and his right eye could only see the left wall. So he went to school when he was six like everybody else, but he couldn't see the blackboard, he couldn't see anything. The teacher put him in the front row and said, you sit there, and he still could see only the two side walls. So eventually they said to him, you'll have to leave school and go and help your father on the farm. He was very disappointed, and he went and farmed, and he stayed that way until he was 19 years old. And when he was 19, he was sick and he had a very high fever and they thought he was going to die. And when he recovered from the fever, guess what? His eyes were straight. 
And he was so excited and he said to his father, I want to go to school. And the father said, you're insane. You'll look like an idiot with all the little six-year-old boys. You're 19 years old. Get over it. But he spoke to his mother and mothers have a, you know, have a way with fathers even if they're tough. And eventually they convinced themselves and James White went to school. And guess what? Within one year, he had caught up with the entire curriculum up to the final standard, which would be matric today. He became an expert in language and writing, in mathematics, in algebra. He was so brilliant that they decided to make him the teacher for the next year in the school. That's quite an amazing story, isn't it? And from there on, he started preaching, and he became one of the great preachers. Now, prophecy. Ellen White received visions, and she didn't want these visions. She wrote, after I had the vision and God gave me light, he bade me deliver it, but I shrank from it. I was young, and I thought they would not receive it from me. So here was this young girl who hadn't had any formal training after the third grade, and she was 17 years old now, and she received these visions, and she wouldn't deliver them. Revelation 10, 9, And I went unto the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said, Take it, eat it. And it will make your belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth as sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it up, and in my mouth it was as sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. This history was fulfilled to the letter in this Advent movement. She wrote the first angel's message of Revelation 14, <coughs> announcing the hour of God's judgment and calling upon men to fear and worship him, was designed to separate the professed people of God from the corrupting influences of the world and to arouse them to see their true condition of worldliness and backsliding. In this message, God has sent to the church a warning which, had it been accepted, would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. So here was a prophetic gift that helped this first little group. And these are the people that were involved in the early movement. You had James White with his squint eyes, and no education until 19, then becoming brilliant. You had Ellen White with a stone against her head, lame on one side, and then you had J.N. Andrews. J.N. Andrews quit school when he was 11. He was self-taught. He spoke seven languages. He could read the Bible in all seven languages as well as recite the New Testament from memory. He began to observe the seventh-day Sabbath at the age of 17 and began to work as a minister at the age of 21, and at 22 he was member of the publishing committee. Unbelievable people. Uriah Smith, what a fascinating individual. He lost his leg in 1844 when he was 12 years old. In those days, when they gave you a false leg, you got one like Captain Hook, a wooden leg, and you walked like this for the rest of your life. This was too slow for him. So this boy sat down and he designed his own leg with a movable ankle and a movable knee. And he designed the first prosthesis that is the basis for the one that is used today. And the American military actually took that patent up and used it for all its people. So he lost it when he was 12 years old. Then he designed this, this leg so that he could get around. By 20, he joined the Adventist movement. He, by the age of 21, he was in the publishing work. Loughborough, he pioneered selling the Adventist literature. He brought out a handbook on health. He was a health freak. And so he introduced the health message. Now the question is, did the Israelites get a health message when God took them out of Egypt, yes or no? Absolutely. They got a health message. And God gave Moses a vision of what they were to eat and what they were not to eat in order to stay healthy. Do you think God will also give a health message 
to people coming out of anti-typical Egypt at the end of time. So here the message starts, and it grew. And people like Calop, did you know that the Seventh-day Adventist church is responsible for changing the entire diet of the Western world in terms of many, many aspects in life? Did you know that? You never even knew it. Did you know that whenever you eat a breakfast cereal, it comes from Seventh-day Adventists? Kellogg was a Seventh-day Adventist. He developed the foods such as wheat picks, post-toasties, granolas, soya milk comes from them. The simple plain peanut butter was developed by Seventh-day Adventists and Marmite was developed by them as a counter to the meat extracts which consisted of everything that was strange and wonderful. So, is there anybody here who has not eaten peanut butter in their lives or not eaten a breakfast cereal in their lives? If so, you've been impacted without you knowing it. The weirdest one, of, not really the weirdest one, but one of the weirdest one was Joseph Bates. Fascinating man. At 15 years of age, he was a cabin boy. They were actually captured by pirates, and he served as a galley slave for many, many years. You know when you row these boats inside? Then he escaped. Eventually he became the captain of his own ship, and his greatest claim to fame is that he could swear more than any other sailor on the planet, and he could spit further than any other sailor on the planet. He smoked like a chimney and drank like a fish. And he was an avid reader of Penny Horribles. So he always had a crate of books that he took with him on his voyages. But he had the good fortune of marrying a good woman. Never underestimate a good woman. And this woman, knowing his bad habits, always sneaked a Bible into his cabin, into his cabinet. And he never read it. He always read the horrible books, you know, the Ludlums and all of those. He read those, paraphrasing. And then one day he decided he was going to start reading this other book. And it totally changed him, there all by himself. And he became a totally changed man. He gave up smoking. He gave up swearing. He gave up spitting. He gave up drinking. And he became an avid Bible student. And he's the first one to write about the Sabbath day and that it is God's day and that it should be introduced again into the world. So he became a model health reformer, had great spiritual fervor, the weirdest bunch of people under the sun. Stephen Nelson, he became an evangelist. He traveled to New Zealand, to Australia, to London, to Western Europe, to Southern Africa, to India, to China, to Japan, baptized people on all of those continents. And the message spread. So Ellen Harmon, lame, uneducated, receives a vision at 17. Abaddon was 21, Bird 20, Butler 22, Daniel's 20, Hiram Edson 37, he was the oldest, Haskell 20, Moses Hull 20, Loughborough 20, Sarah McEntifer, a tough lady, a tough lady who made sure that everything was just perfectly right when it went out. They were all in their 20s. How old were the disciples? Also in their early 20s and probably 17. John was probably 17 when he joined as a disciple of Jesus. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, For you see your calling, brethren, are that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
But of him ye are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorifieth, let him glory in the Lord. So here was a bunch of people that the elite of the world might despise. But so was John the Baptist despised. He was not trained in any of the schools. And so the disciples, they were simple fishermen. There was only one learned man amongst them, eventually, and he wasn't part of the original crowd, and that was Luke. He was a medical doctor, and Paul later was a highly educated theologian. But the rest were simple fishermen. So the greatest heroes that ever walked amongst men was born in a manger, crucified on a cross, rejected and despised, to this day is maligned, marginalized, misrepresented, even by those who supposedly serve him. This is nothing new. Isaiah 53 verse 2, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So shouldn't his disciples fall in the same category? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? This is where God works. He uses simple people who want to know what God is all about. And he empowers them that in one year they catch up on curriculums that other t people take 12 years to cover. And then adds the university degree so that they become the teacher. 1 Corinthians 14.8 For the trumpets give a, an uncertain sound who shall prepare himself to battle. So how must this message be given? With a whimper? Cry loud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression, the house of Jacob their sin. So this simple lady wrote, We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecies are fulfilling. The last great conflict will be short but terrible. Old controversies will be revived. New ones will arise. The last warning must be given to the world. There's a special power in the presentation of the truth at the present time. How long will it continue? Only a little while. If ever there was a crisis, it is now. Decided effort should be made to bring the message for this time prominently before the people. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. There's going to be a message. God is not going to leave the world unwarned. Before the flood there was a Noah. Before the coming of the Lord, there'll be a message. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. We're talking about grace, to find mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. We need to develop biblical faith. And then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive it not in vain. Did you know that there are only two truly worldwide religious movements in the world? Only two. And this over here is the American Bible Society and Church Missions document which lists every single denomination on the planet and tells you where they are distributed. Only two are worldwide. Guess who they are? Catholicism and Seventh-day Adventism. The only two. Now let's see what Catholicism says about the issue. It's not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1, 3, but the Catholic Church that can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. We saw that text. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. So what they're saying is they're speaking like George Bush. You're either with us or you're a terrorist. That's what he said. Didn't he say that? That's what he said. Let's see how far they will say this. Sunday is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Ghost without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. 
You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day we never sanctify. This is Cardinal Gibbons speaking. So here's the Catholic Church making a very bold statement. And then they say, Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. It is a law of the Catholic Church alone. And the observance of Sunday by Protestants is a homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. Pretty arrogant, eh? Will they go further? Yes, the Catholic mirror. The Protestant says, how can I receive the teaching of an apostate church? How, we ask, have you managed to receive a teaching all your life? In direct opposition to your recognized teacher, the Bible on the Sabbath question. And those who follow the Bible as their guide, the Israelites and the Seventh-day Adventists, have the exclusive weight of evidence on their side, while the biblical Protestant has not a word in self-defense for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. So now they start mentioning the Adventists. Let's see what else they say about them. They say the Adventists are the only body of Christians with the Bible as their teacher who find no warrant in its pages for change of day from the seventh to the first. Hence their appellation, Seventh-day Adventists. So it's not just a name. It's a name with a meaning. It means we keep the law of God, including the seventh day, and we believe in the soon coming of Christ, the advent of Christ. Question box. This is an answering box official from the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by a founder, Jesus Christ. The Protestant claiming to be the Bible as the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. And in this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. And then the Cardinal writes in the Catholic Sentinel, people who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. This is the Catholic Church writing. This is the Catholic Church. And then Rome issued its challenge in 2003 again and said most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath Saturday to Sunday and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. We've been through this. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. And then what does it say? What does the editor say to this? He writes, The challenge issued by Rome of a hundred years ago remains. Either the Catholic Church is right, or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. There can be no other choice. And then they unpack it and they say, if you choose neither, then the whole doctrine of sola scriptura collapses. And with it, the pillars upon which all of Protestantism stands. And what one has left is an invented religion, an invented God, an invented set of beliefs that suits man's purpose and not the Creator's. Like Satan and Luther before them, Protestants have spoken the creed in action and in thought, if not in word, I will not serve. So they don't like Seventh-day Adventists. But they admit that you have, if you want to be sola scriptura, you have to choose one or the other. You're either with them or you're with the Adventists. Now this is tough. I was a Catholic. I was also an occultist. My mother was a Lutheran. My natural inclination would to be like the Lutherans. But the Lutherans don't keep the Sabbath. The Lutherans have changed their doctrines away from what Martin Luther believed, and they believe something totally new. I need some remnant that believes like the original. And so here is an impasse. And now this church that I belong to says, you're either with us or you're with them. So what kind of church is this? This is a massive church. In every single country, it's a minority and a sect. But worldwide, it is massive. It is the largest Protestant worldwide movement in terms of education. The Adventist Church has more schools per capita than any other denomination other than Catholicism on the face of the planet. It is the largest health 
distributing organization in the Protestant world. It has more hospitals and medical practitioners and dentist practitioners than any other Protestant denomination in the entire world. It doesn't matter where you go. If you go to Europe, you will find them. If you go to Zurich, you will find them. If you want to go to a hospital, you will find them all over Europe. You'll find them right next to the Vatican in Rome. This is the Adventgemeinde in Swiss, Switzerland. This is our college in England. And these are camp meetings all over the world. There's St. Helena's Hospital. There's Loma Linda Hospital. By the way, the budget of this one institution exceeds the entire budget of the Dutch Reformed Church in its heyday. One institution. This is not a small little group of people. This is groundbreaking research. This is where they did some of the most magnificent surgery. And you will find a whole health section with alternative medicine at the same place. Practicing conventional medicine with operations together with natural help and alternative. And hundreds and thousands of small institutes scattered in the strangest little places in the world with little health shops, little bookshops, bakeries, baking good bread, whether you go to Norway or not. These are African hospitals. This one is in Malawi. This is the institute in, uh, in the Cape. This is Helderberg College. So it's a large institution. And they keep the commandments because Jesus said, if you love me, keep the commandments. Now, are they perfect people? Let me tell you what they are. They are pathetic. Am I being too crass here? What does the Bible say about them? What is the state of Laodicea? You are blind, pitiful, wretched, and naked. And I counsel you to buy from me food or salve or gold to be refined in the fire. I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire and I solve that you may see or else I will spit you out of my mouth. Let me tell you that this church is more of a hospital than it is a church movement. It is a hospital. And the people that are in it have been crippled and maimed and blinded and bludgeoned by the world. And God specializes in such people. And he goes and picks them up. And Satan despises them. And he says, is this the best you've got? These miserable individuals? And God says, you watch me when I turn these miserable individuals into people that are on fire for my word and who love me because I have redeemed them. And they are a fire on this world. The ark was full of smelly creatures. The ark was full of manure. But if you were not in the ark, you were outside in the storm. So that is the choice of the matter. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. You know, people always say to me, I love this truth. I love what you are saying. I understand the Sabbath, but I want nothing to do with the denomination. Because that is something that I do not anticipate ever doing again. I've come out of this denomination, that denomination, that denomination, and I'm through with denominations. The Spirit will lead me. I will follow God and I'll do these things, but I'll do them by myself. Did God operate like that in the beginning, yes or no? No. When he converted Paul on the road to Damascus, what did he do? Send him to the church. And the church, did they, did they welcome him with open arms or were they scared spitless? <laughs> They despised him. They were scared of him. He was a monster. Here was this 
terrible persecutor, and now he was suddenly in the church. And he had to submit themselves. This Paul, this learned man, had to submit themselves, himself to these simple people. And God used Paul mightily, but he sent him to the church. And the Bible says, and they were added to the church daily. God is a God of order. And this text doesn't say, and the Spirit says, come. This text says, the Spirit and the bride says, come. Because God does nothing separate from his people. If you're looking for perfection, you won't find it here. If you're looking for saints, you might think they are all saints in the beginning, but you'll find out that they are people with weaknesses who struggle with, with the issues of life like everyone else. But they have one thing in common. They love the truth. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. And so that is my invitation to you. I also struggled when I came to this church. I struggled like you cannot believe. They had to drag me in here feet first. Not physically, but prophetically. And when I'd exhausted all the possibilities, I realized this is where the truth is being preached, where the message is being taught, and whether the people in it are perfect or not, some apostate or not, doesn't matter. This is the official church teaching, the official church doctrine, and it's biblical, and I'm going to run with it. And I invite you, if you find the opportunity in your heart, to study these things and to see if the definitions of the bride fit, to think about these things. Rome says, you're either with them or you're with me. There's no other choice. And I can guarantee you some good news. There's a clash coming. And you will be on the pathetic side of the clash, outnumbered like you cannot believe. But if you could open your eyes and look at the hilltops behind you, you would see angels, billions of them, that stand on the side of right. The majority does not necessarily follow the dictates of the Lord. On the contrary, they normally do the opposite. May God bless you as you contemplate these things and thank you very much for listening.